What's going on, people? Welcome to Members Only. Tonight, we're going to cover our man that flooded the streets in New Orleans. Now, this is my first time covering Louisiana, and damn sure it won't be my last. So, you know, just drop some names in the comments. Now, in the early 90s, it was said that Richard Pina was bringing in 300 blocks a month. Even though I don't really like mentioning numbers because you'll never know the exact number. He only knows that. But he had them joints out for the low. He had the best prices during the time with connections in Mexico, Houston, and Miami. Now, he could have been moving in different areas. I'm pretty sure he was, but I'm just letting you guys know what's on paper. Now, the ignorant streets called him the Cuban, but he was 100% Dominican. Now, when I say ignorance, I'm talking about the lack of knowledge. Like, they should have known what he was. They probably just said, oh, this Puerto Rican dude or this Mexican or, you know, Cuban dude. Now, who knows if he was the head of the organization because he had his mother, father, sister, brothers, cousins, all a part of the organization, so who knows? Now, his run began in 1990. It could have been earlier. I'm just going with what I researched, but his run in the U.S. started in 1990. Now, he stayed low and, you know, pretty much out the way. You know, no one knew what he looked like. You know, he had a body shop in, you know, Louisiana during that time. Now, one of his first acts to draw some attention was in 1991. It was around 10 p.m. His truck was stopped and about $25,000 in cash was inside a brown paper bag was found and was seized. He was also wearing a bulletproof vest. He was arrested for reckless operation of a vehicle. But you gotta think the amount of money that was found. You have to ask yourself, how much was $25,000 in 1991? And he was, you know, riding around with that amount of money and to be caught wearing a bulletproof vest, law enforcement had to keep an eye out on him. Another thing that drew some attention was when he purchased a boat for $25,000 in cash. I don't know about the 90s, but nowadays, when you make large purchases with straight cash, the place that you're purchasing from has to notify the IRS. Okay, so they called him a ghost for a reason because you heard his name but didn't know what he looked like. He'll be in a place one moment and going by the next. In 93, he was able to escape a sting operation. When he went to purchase some keys, he got right out of there. Now, others were arrested and gave up some information on him. Now, you know, he was getting so much money that he had to clean it through his record label and nightclubs. Most say he's the most feared drug lord in New Orleans history. The word on the street is that he offered Master P a million dollars to get down with the label, but Master P turned it down. And you know, Master P cut ties and got away when things was getting hot. And you know, that was a you know that was a smart move. Richard Pina was the real deal that you know Soldier Slim gave him a name drop on the track. Now when it came to his record company, Seska Records, which you might be wondering where the name came from, he named it after his daughter. But I heard Death Row ain't have nothing on them. Artists would go to his studio to record music and it would be Stone Cold Killer standing around, heavily armed with mean mugs, looking like a coke deal was going on. <laughs> you know, and um, that used to scare some of his artists and engineers. And I heard people was getting slapped around in there. He used to have to call his artists and, you know, to apologize and tell them everything's going to be okay. You know, but they had a, a reason to fear this man. The type of stuff he was doing was ruthless. He aired two of his own suppliers in his own car. He cleaned the stains and gifted to his brother-in-law. Now, to take over the streets and become number one, you have to knock heads off to let people know you ain't playing. You have to get rid of who's ever in your way. He went to all the popping areas in New Orleans. He would drop his work off in that area. Now you work for him. If anyone had a problem, he'll send people to come see you and help change your mind. Another thing is to have cops in your back pocket. You ain't as big as you think you are if cops aren't on your payroll, homie. And for the ones that play with a Chapina, he'll show you how much power he had when he had the cops serve you to him. Imagine being in cuffs getting served to this man, then tortured for three to four days getting salt poured on your wounds. He had cops out in the streets like foot soldiers. I'm sure it's kind of hard being clean 
when you are arresting guys in drug spots seeing thousands of dollars that triples your yearly salary. He even had cops out there moving bricks for him. You can't make this stuff up. Now on April 17, 1997, Richard Pina was arrested in Diamond Head, Mississippi for various drug trafficking offenses. Now his money was something else, man. He was pulled over with five million dollars in cash inside his van. Now during the investigation, his label artist Kane and Abel were detained by federal DEA agents for questioning. Things like murders and narcotics were brought up. They even questioned Master P being one of Pina's biggest customers, but they stood tall and they didn't fold. I mean. You had to be crazy to tell on this man with all the connections he had. At the age of 32, Richard Pina accepted a life sentence and a $2.5 million fine for eight murders he orchestrated while leading one of the largest and most violent trafficking organizations ever to take root in New Orleans. Now, I don't know why would they even think someone they just gave life or pay anything. Like, I already got life. What more could you do? <laughs> But the prosecutors dropped the death penalty in exchange for a detailed confession, and it was about 27 pages, and you could probably look it up somewhere on the internet. Now, he even plotted to escape prison and go on a rampage. But he allegedly was still running his organization behind bars. I can't tell you anything about what's going on now with him. Some say early on he got caught with his hands in the cookie jar a few times and earned himself a couple of get out of jail free cards. But who knows if it's true, people? Who's going to be the one that say something? Because just like I said, this man was feared. But shout out to all my supporters. Thanks for the likes and the motivating comments. We're more than halfway through the year. I hope y'all doing the right thing, taking care of the fans, traveling, seeing the world. If y'all need me, y'all know where to find me. I'm out.